but I feel pretty good about that. All right, so today is April 13th, 2021. It is a Tuesday, and it's also the second day of our eighth unit. Today's lesson will focus on natural selection. So this is really the fundamental foundational discussion that we need to have before talking about evolution. Natural selection basically is the mechanism by which evolution is possible. So the objective today is to explain how natural selection influences the changes in species over time. And the essential question is what is natural selection and what are its key components? So, um, again, feel free to use whatever you want. You can join in the chat box too. You can use your own notes. You can take virtual notes. Whatever works for you is fine with me. <coughs> yes, sir. Yeah, it's right behind you. All right, so hopefully you all were able to knock out that warm up at the beginning of class. Pretty simple stuff. It was just based on what we talked about yesterday as it related to classification systems. So does anybody remember what the most general classification level is? Domain, good, thank you. Um, and then what about after that? We're gonna get more and more specific with each level. So kingdom. Phylum, good. Class, order, family, genus, and then species, of course. Good. So I introduced you all to the mnemonic device that I think most people use to remember the order of these levels. Do keep pond clean or froggy get sick. You can make up your own. In fact, if you do make up your own, I'll give you extra credit towards your unit seven exam, which we took uh, before spring break. And it doesn't have to be in English either. If you wanna come up with a mnemonic device in another language, I think that would be cool too. So um, think about it. If you can come up with your own, I'll give you extra credit. All right, and then yesterday we also talked about these dichotomous keys. Also pretty simple to use, but I just wanted to make sure I included at least one practice problem. I have seen a dichotomous key appear in an EOC exam in the past. So I just wanna make sure you all know how to use these. We've got these five sets of two statements. Um, the first set of statements says, has green colored body or has purple colored body? Um, what are we told in the question? Good, so it has a purple body. That's the first bit of information. So um, based on that, what should we do? Once we know it has a purple body, yeah, thank you, Lance. So this organism has, is it working? yeah, it has a purple colored body. And that tells us that we should go to the fourth set of statements down there. All right, and then what information does the question tell us that is, that is helpful here? Good, so it does not have a pointy hump. So that tells us that we need to jump down to the fifth set of statements. Now notice that if it did have a pointy hump, we would have already been able to identify the scientific name of this species, but alas, it does not, so we have to keep going. Jump down to the fifth set of statements. And then now we need to know, does it have ears or not? It does, has, it does have ears, therefore the scientific name is Deerus purplinus. And no, this is not, these are not real species. <laughs> All right, so that's how these dichotomous keys work. You just start with the first set of statements and then you try to answer them um, until you find this, the scientific name of the species. And I didn't wanna, I think I had in the warm up three questions based on this phylogenetic tree. Um, I didn't wanna just go over the questions specifically, but we do wanna be able to 
to, to dissect these phylogenetic trees and, and know what information they're giving us. So if we're looking at this phylogenetic trees, I see the letters A, B, C, D, E, F, G. I also see what looks like eight different species. And I also see what looks like seven different characteristics. We're not gonna worry about, if you look on the right side, you can see the word in group. And then if you look under the hagfish, it says out group. We don't need to worry about what that means, but we do wanna pay attention to the characteristics as well as to kind of the branching off points. So I'm just gonna quiz you a little bit off the top of my head here. Um, of those letters, A, B, C, D, E, F, G, bless you. Of those letters, uh, which one of them is the common ancestor of a lizard and a robin? Where, what's that? Wait, what? <laughs> the letter E, good, sorry, I couldn't. What about the common ancestor between a lizard and a gorilla? Which letter would that be? D, yeah, that would be the letter D. Good, so we're just kind of identifying the branching off points here. Uh, let's see. Which species does not have jaws? The hagfish, yeah. And the jaws are here. So the jaws were a physical characteristic that developed after the hagfish had already evolved. Uh, which species do not have claws or nails? The frog, the salmon, and the hagfish do not have claws or nails. Again, that is a physical characteristic that came about after those species had already evolved. All right, so we just want to make sure we're comfortable with these phylogenetic trees. I, I haven't really seen any questions about them in recent years on, EO, on the EOC, so it could be that we won't get one, or it could be that we're due for one. Interesting. You, uh, you're big into zoology, huh? <laughs> um, yeah, the animal kingdom is... We'll talk more about that later in this unit, but it's, it's got some, some odd stuff going on. Um, but like I said, we might not see a phylogenetic tree question on the EOC. We might see one because they haven't covered it in the last few years. Um, who knows, but we just wanna be comfortable with them. So any questions about this? Anything that anyone's not clear on? Okay. <clears throat> so today we're gonna, discuss natural selection. And we have to think about this from the historical development of this concept. So before there was natural selection, there was this idea that came from Charles Darwin called descent with modification. Okay, which continent is this? Africa, good. What do we know about Africa? Any, can anyone tell me any, like just random facts? Okay, yeah, this, uh, the, the earliest known humans lived in Ethiopia. It's the largest continent by land, yeah, which is kind of distorted by some maps. What else do we know? How many African countries can we name? That's seven, there are about 50 of them. <laughs> Geography tends not to be one of the things that we, uh, we teach very well in school, but it's a, it's a place where there's rich history. It's a place where there's obviously a diverse set of um, geography and also a lot of diverse life as well. What I wanna focus on, thank you so much for that, Lucy. You, you knocked out seven countries, that's, that's pretty good actually. Uh, what I wanna focus on is the deserts here. So number one, we see, does anybody know what this thing is? Yeah, this is just a uh, um, And we can see that Africa has a rich diet. Like, even though it's a very urban region, 
that can't come to that fact. There's still a great amount of land in sub Saharan parts of the world that rust and breed. Um, but then we can see in the bottom left, this the southwestern tip of the continent, there's also another desert there. Um, and that is called the Namib Desert. In this Namib Desert, there are these huge sand dunes. Um, and a sand dune is basically just uh, not quite a mountain, but a very large hill of sand that is uh, formed over many millions of years because of the way that the winds, the wind blows. Um, and if you look on these sand dunes, you look closely enough, you'll find this beetle. I'm not gonna try to pronounce the scientific name, but you can see it there. The scientific name, of course, is made up of two levels from our classification system. Does anybody remember? Which two levels? Okay. Yeah, we just talked about this yesterday. <laughs> So the, the eight levels of the classification system are domain, kingdom. So I'm asking which two levels are those words? I'll give you a hint. They're the two most specific. So what are the two? Those are the two most general. Genus, species, good. So the first word is So that's how we form these scientific names. We take the genus and we take the species. Notice that it is italicized. And again, the genus is capitalized and the species is not capitalized. All right, so this, this beetle is pretty cool. And I think it's, a, it's an interesting way to think about um, this idea of descent with modification. Uh, obviously in the desert, water comes at a premium. You can't find water all that easily. Desert environments don't have much groundwater and it doesn't rain in the desert very often. Um, so the only way that most uh, species of insects can get water is by collecting it literally from the atmosphere, collecting it from the air. So what this bug has figured out how to do is basically to tilt its head down. Um, and as these huge clouds of fog kind of move past the sand dunes, uh, the beetle can actually collect droplets of water uh, on its oily exoskeleton. And those droplets of water will then kind of drop down into its mouth. And that's, that's literally how it drinks. Um, and so this is, as we might imagine, a pretty ingenious um, development of nature. In fact, it's so ingenious that human beings have started to copy it, which, which I'll, I'll talk about in a video I'll show you shortly. But even though it has this, this specific species of beetle has this really remarkable ability, of course, it's not alone. In fact, um, beetles are the most widely known species or the most widely known family of organisms um, on Earth. There are 350,000 known species of beetles. As we can see in this image, they, they come in different shapes and sizes and different colors. They live all across the globe in various habitats. So they're you know, a very diverse family um, of species, but they're also pretty similar. All, all beetles have three pairs of legs. All beetles have two pairs of wings and they all have a hard exoskeleton as well to provide support and protection. So we see the similarities. We know that they're also quite diverse. Before we solve a problem, we should ask, has it been solved anywhere in the natural world? Life has ingenious ways of meeting its needs. In the Namib Desert, 
there's very little groundwater, but there is a fog that comes in a few times a week. And there's a tiny black beetle that climbs up to the top of a dune, stands on his head, lifts his wing scales up into that flow. And on these wing scales, there are bumps. The tips of the bumps are like magnets for water. The sides of the bumps are waxy. So fog comes in, begins to aggregate on the tips, the water runs down the trough and into the critter's mouth. This is being mimicked now in fog catching nets that are 10 times better than the fog catching nets we currently have. In fact, there's a company that is putting this surface on the inside of water bottles to create a self-filling water bottle. Water is the new oil. It's what nations will be fighting over, unfortunately. Being able to pull water out of air, that's one of the more exciting biomimetic areas. For more episodes of Think Like a Tree, subscribe to the Wired channel. So as she was, as the narrator was saying in that video, um, water is going to continue to be one of the more scarce resources on the planet. In fact, in the next 100 years, water is expected to be just at drinkable water, that is, is expected to be as scarce as oil, as natural gas. So because of that, it's going to continue to be more expensive and countries will begin to fight conflicts over water. In fact, today in Yemen, does anybody know where Yemen is? Okay, Yemen is right here. Today in Yemen, there's a civil war being fought um, over the scarcity of food and water. So we're already seeing it in 2021, countries that are at war with themselves um, because of this lack of water. So we've learned from this beetle that we can actually use similar, well, we can create technologies um, that can collect water from the air. Um, of course, if you look at the map again, Yemen is surrounded by water, essentially. It's not quite an island, but it's basically a peninsula. But even then, that water is not drinkable. Of course, ocean water is, is too salty. Um, it's not potable. So uh, we, need to we need to create other ways of collecting water, and, and this is one of the most genius ways of doing it and we got it from a bug. So these observations have, have led us, or I guess this bug has, has led us to three useful observations, and this is kind of where your notes start. Number one, organisms are remarkably well-suited for their environments. So we would not see this specific beetle in the rainforest, because in the rainforest there is an excess of water because of precipitation. We wouldn't see this specific beetle living uh, in most valleys because in most valleys there's an excess of water in the form of, of groundwater. But we do see it in this desert environment where it needed to come up with some clever way of collecting water from the air. The second observation is that organisms have shared characteristics that hint at a unity of life. So we, we saw that, that image of all those beetles, but we know that they all have three pairs of legs, two pairs of wings, and a hard exoskeleton. So that leads us to think maybe at one point in the distant past, they all share a common ancestor. That was the first species of beetle, the first species to have those characteristics. But even within that, over time and through this process of, of evolution that we'll talk more about on Thursday, <clears throat> the organisms have become remarkably diverse.
<clears throat> not one of the first people to actually make these observations and start to synthesize ideas about them was Charles Darwin. Here he is pictured at the end of his life, but <clears throat> he was actually most prolific when he was still in his 20s and 30s, um, traveling around the world. Uh, so he made these observations and with these observations, he proposed that Earth's many species are descendants of ancestral species that were different than the present day species. Said the word species a lot there. Um, he called this idea descent with modification. So you start off with this ancestor species and over time, and again, we're not talking about the course of one or two generations, we're talking about thousands of years. Over time, we see modification taking place, specific traits that start to appear um, that perhaps were, were not present in that ancestral species. So this is descent with modification. He didn't have the term evolution. He did not use that term. He didn't use the term natural selection, but uh, his ideas did lead us to, to, to those ideas, those concepts. Um, so there he is. In 1840, I think he was in his late 30s at that point, um, traveling on this, this ship called the HMS Beagle. He left the coast of Great Britain and, and literally sailed around the world, specifically in the Southern Hemisphere. Um, and went around the Southern coast of South America, Cape Horn, and they made one of their, their most important stops in the Galapagos Islands. The Galapagos Islands are just off the Western coast of Ecuador. Uh, and they're an archipelago of volcanic islands. And that just means it's a, col it's a collection of islands. Uh, and this is where some of his most important discoveries and observations took place. All right, let's look at these videos. This living laboratory of evolution helped to inspire Charles Darwin and continues to offer a unique opportunity to explore a pristine natural ecosystem. The Galapagos Islands are located 620 miles or 1,000 kilometers from the South American mainland, but a world apart from anywhere else on Earth. The archipelago and its surrounding waters, located where three ocean currents converge, are famed for the unique animal species found nowhere else on Earth, including marine iguanas, giant tortoises, flightless cormorants, and a diverse variety of finches. The islands have two airports, Isla Baltra and Isla San Cristobal, which are serviced by regular flights from mainland cities Quito and Guayaquil. As water temperatures change and seasons shift, different types of wildlife become more or less plentiful, so it's worth keeping a must-see species list in mind when planning your itinerary. ancestors of these iguanas almost certainly lived in the jungles of Central America. There, still today, you can see iguanas in the trees overhanging the rivers, nibbling leaves, or on rafts of reeds. Just occasionally, are swept out to sea, and the vast majority, of course, die there. But just a few, a long time ago, were fortunate enough to be swept by favorable currents out to the ocean and pitched up here. In their ancestral rainforest habitat, iguanas are vegetarians. Here, they browse on juicy leaves. But the iguanas that first appeared in the Galapagos could find no such things. So these iguanas, to survive, had to eat the only kind of leaf that was available. Seaweed. And to get the best of that, they had to do something even more radical.
they had to swim. They even learned to dive. They acquired the ability to hold their breath for up to an hour so that they could swim down to a depth of 20 meters. Their claws strengthened so they could cling to the rocks on the seabed. And under the water, they found an endless supply of seaweed which grew in abundance in the nutrient-rich currents that flow around the islands. was not all. Their snouts became flatter to help them graze. And their teeth became sharper to grip the slippery seaweed. The ancestors of in that David Attenborough video, the second video that we just watched, he talked about the fact that um, many of those iguanas started off on the mainland and they ended up being swept out into sea. He said most of them died at that point, but some of them had adaptations uh, specific adaptations that allowed them to survive a 620 mile um, trek from the mainland to the Galapagos Islands. At the time that this happened, it, they may not have been 620 miles away, it may have been closer than that. Um, but it's just important to note that the adaptations that they, that they had to allow them to get that far, they already possessed. It wasn't like a choice that they, that they made to, um, to travel to the island. So this is something we'll return to, the fact that the, the variation that allowed them to have that adaptation already existed. We'll, we'll return to that idea. But one of Darwin's most important ideas was that organisms shared a common ancestor. And in the same way that we might envision a tree of life or even a family tree, we can see them begin to branch off um, at a point in time at which they separate. So if we look at this family tree here, um, if you look at the bottom, you can see three species of elephants. In fact, these are the only three species of elephants that currently exist today. Um, there are two species that live on the African continent, and there's one species that is native to the Asian continent. Um, however, these are not the only elephant species that have ever existed. It's just that the others are now extinct, and most of them have been extinct since the last ice age. The woolly mammoth, for example, has been extinct for about 10,000 years. Um, but these, they all come from the same family tree. They all have common ancestors. And uh, if you look at the bottom of this image, I know it's really small for you guys, but it says millions of years ago. So you can see that some of these, uh, some of these species have been extinct for a long time. And they also share common ancestors that existed a long time ago. For example, the woolly mammoth, shared a common ancestor with the surviving elephants that uh, existed about 5.5 million years ago. Um, and probably because of geographic separation, they developed into two distinct species. Um, there are efforts ongoing today uh, to potentially try to bring woolly mammoths back um, because we do have some DNA from woolly mammoths and, and there are some thoughts that if we breed carefully with elephants, we could potentially get the woolly mammoth back, which would be a pretty, you know, 
foundational discovery if we could do that because we could bring back a lot of species in that way. But of course, there are ethical concerns when we start to do these things as well. But if you look at the top of the family tree, we can see a hyraxis, which is basically a big uh, gopher. And that still exists today. It is not extinct. And it is a distant cousin, essentially, of, of, of elephants. But they're, they're, they're small. They're basically the size of rabbits. Um, and then you can also see a manatee, which is also a distant cousin of, of the current day elephants. Of course, manatees live, um, they're, they are marine animals. So uh, it's just interesting when you start to look at some of these family trees and realize which current day species have uh, distant common ancestors. All right, this is where I want you all to start writing as well. <clears throat> so when we think about natural selection, Natural selection happens primarily, well, we have to acknowledge that species have the potential to increase in numbers exponentially. They have the potential. So it doesn't mean that they do increase in numbers exponentially. It just means that the potential for them to do that is there. For those of you who are thinking about taking the AP class or studying zoology or biology further, um, you'll learn about cl different classification systems than the ones we just learned. For example, there are what are called R-selected species, and then there are K-selected species. R-selected species are bacteria, insects, rodents that reproduce extremely quickly. They might have you know, anywhere between 100 and 10,000 offspring in a single year. Uh, they tend not to have very long lifespans. They tend not to have very sophisticated central nervous systems. So their brains are not uh, capable of very complex processing. The opposite of that is a K-selected species. Um, a K-selected species, classic example would be a, a human being or an elephant. K-selected species tend to be larger. They have longer lifespans. They might only have one child every five years or so. Um, and they have much more sophisticated central nervous systems, more, you know, larger brains that allow for more processing. Uh, so it's an interesting distinction. But in any case, we know that even K-selected species can increase in numbers exponentially, as the human population has. Um, I think it took about I think it took about eighty thousand years for human beings to for the modern human beings to have a population of one billion. Uh, of course, we went from seven billion to eight billion in only about seven years. So we're, we've increased exponentially, and this is going to be something we'll talk more about because it's presenting obviously huge problems. <clears throat> Has anybody ever heard of kudzu? Kudzu. Kudzu is that vine that's right there in the middle, that middle image. Um, it is an invasive species that originated in Japan, but uh, is now kind of taking over the American South. So if you ever drive, even here in Charlotte, you can see some kudzu around. It is it's taking over. It's, um, you can, you'll see it on the side of buildings. It's kind of killing out other plant species, and it's a big problem. Yeah, you can, yeah. And it'll go up telephone poles and it's, it's, it's a problem. <laughs> but of course, like I said, they have the potential to increase exponentially, but they can't because in most cases there is a finite supply of the resources that they need. So in the image on the left, we see organisms competing for a finite supply, a limited supply of water. On the right, we can see organisms competing for a finite supply of sunlight. You know, plants that are on the bottom of the rainforest, on the floor of the rainforest, uh, are not getting much sunlight because of the dense canopy that exists above them. So you'll notice that they have these really broad leaves to capture as much sunlight as possible. Okay, so because of this limited supply of resources, we see a lot of competition resulting competition between species, but also competition within species.
Okay. So how do populations decide which organisms survive and reproduce and which ones die? Of course, this is kind of a uh, false question because it isn't a decision. It's a matter of which organisms have the adaptations that will allow them to survive. Now, when I say adaptations, again, it's not a choice. It's not like organisms wake up and decide that they are going to put themselves in the best possible position to survive. Some organisms are just better suited for their environment based on naturally occurring genetic variability. So we think about these ladybugs. There are no two individuals that are exactly alike, even in this one image of maybe that's, that might be 30 ladybugs. But let's say that for whatever reason, a predator decides that uh, they are not going to eat ladybugs that have fewer than four spots on their back. That means that eventually the entire population will be comprised of ladybugs that have fewer than four spots on their back because all the other ladybugs with a lot of spots will, will be preyed upon, they'll be eaten. Okay, so that genetic variability that already existed there were already ladybugs that had four spots. It protected them. It gave them a specific advantage in, the envi in their environment that allowed them to survive. All right, so, and this is, what we're, this is what we're talking about. The environment is going to provide some type of um, need to compete. And the organisms that have an advantage, whether it be a genetic advantage or a, a phenotypic advantage, those are the organisms that end up surviving and then that end up reproducing. So here we can see the okapi on the left. The okapi at its tallest will only reach about five foot seven. The okapi is actually the ancestor of the giraffe though. Um, the okapi of course was not going to be able to compete for limited resources uh, when all of the food that was either on the ground or that was hanging pretty low to the ground was gone. That meant that specific organisms within the population of okapi that had longer necks had an advantage. They were able to reach food that was higher up. So today we know that the giraffe is its own distinct species and the tallest giraffes can be 18.7 feet tall. This gives them access to food that other terrestrial um, animals simply cannot have. All right, but the okapi is, like I said, an ancestor of the giraffe. Okay, the organisms with favorable adaptations survive, reproduce, and pass on their genes. That's the, uh, that's the whole idea here. It's not just about survival. You've got to be able to reproduce so that your genes can be carried into the next generation. For example, here's an image of me and my parents and my twin sister. You can see how the, the genes have been uh, carried, right? Do we look alike? <laughs> my dad and I, maybe. <clears throat> All 
Okay, and then as those genes are passed on, the genes that provide some type of advantage will eventually start to accumulate throughout the entire species. Because more and more of the individuals with the advantage will survive, meaning more and more of them will, re will reproduce, and their children will also have that advantage. The ones who are disadvantaged will start to, unfortunately, die off. Unfortunately or fortunately, depending on how you see it. And this is the process of evolution. So this does not happen between one generation and the next. This happens over many, many generations. Those are selected species that I was talking about, the bacteria, the rodents, the insects, uh, the fish in some cases, they reproduce a lot. So evolution can happen a little bit faster in our selected species. In case-selected species, it takes a, a, a really long time because they're just not having offspring all that often. So we'll talk more about this this uh, this organism here. Tiktaalik is one of the most talked about organisms in evolutionary biology because it is proposed, or I guess hypothesized, that Tiktaalik was the very first amphibian, the first organism that had the ability to live underwater, but then came out of the water onto the land. Tomorrow, during our uh, virtual lesson, it'll be a quick one, I'll talk a little bit about why Earth was not suitable for life for a long time. And then when it was finally suitable for life, it was only suitable for life underwater. Um, even plants could not have existed on land due to the atmospheric conditions. Once things changed a little bit and there was more oxygen in the atmosphere, we do start to see plants that are, that are living on land. Um, in response to that, of course, the animals that were living underwater, instead of competing for the same resources underwater, some of them start to emerge from the water and move onto the land. Um, so Pictolic is thought to be the first species to successfully do this and to be able to not just come out temporarily, but to come out, lay its eggs, um, eat food, and then kind of reemerge into the water for a period of time. We'll talk more about that. Okay. So here's this definition uh, of natural selection, the process in which organisms that are better adapted to their environment tend to survive and produce more offspring. This is also known as survival of the fittest. And again, fittest, fitness in this case is not discussing how well uh, an organism can run or how much weight an organism can lift. Fitness is referring in this case to how well it can reproduce. The individuals that reproduce the most within a population end up spreading their genes to the most offspring. Okay, is this the last thing? I'm having you guys try. So to sum it up, the four most important components of natural selection are genetic variation, inheritance, competition, and reproduction. 
these four things lead to this process, survival of the fittest. Mm -hmm. It's right across the hall. Okay. <clears throat> Okay, so another good example. So uh, we're looking at three species of finch. These are all birds that live on the Galapagos Islands. They're very similar birds. Um, they look pretty similar even in terms of their feather color. I think the bird on the right is a chick, so it, it, it's, uh, it still hasn't mulched yet, meaning it doesn't have its adult, adult feathers yet. Um, but they look similar. But if you look closely, they have different beaks. So my question is why? Why do you think they have these different beaks? Good, yeah, it's about their food. So most organisms want to occupy a specific niche in their, envi in their environment that other organisms cannot occupy, meaning um, they wanna be able to have access to a specific type of food that other organisms can't occupy. That means that they don't have to, they don't have to compete for it as much. So uh, the bird in the top left actually eats cacti. And so it's got a very specific type of beak that allows it to, to puncture the cactus and to get the nutrients from the cactus. The bird on the bottom is a seed eater. So it really doesn't fly that much because it just eats seeds that fall to the ground. So you can see it's got that really wide, thick beak. Um, and it's also really hard to allow it to, to puncture the seeds. And then the bird in the top right is an insect eater. Okay, so it's got a long pointy beak that allows it to kind of access insects that might be hiding within the bark of trees. Um, so different beaks to access different foods. This is, this is natural selection. Darwin hypothesized that these birds probably arrived as a singular species on the Galapagos Islands. Um, but because of that competition, in order to access different types of foods, we saw them start to become different species uh, with, different, with different sized beaks. Okay, practice question here. Most individuals of a certain species of bird have medium length tails, but tail length ranges within the species from very short to very long. If a new predator arrived that preferred to prey on birds with medium length tails, which graph describes the most likely result? What do we think? We've got tail length on the x-axis of this of these graphs and number of birds on the y-axis. So um, that means that as you move from left to right, the tail the tails are getting longer. And as you move from bottom to top, we're talking about more birds that have that tail length. So if a new predator arrives and it only eats birds with medium length tails, what's going to happen? Okay, so does anybody agree with Sally? Everybody's asleep. 
She said C. Okay, so Sally, I think that's, um, I think you're thinking in the right way. But we have to remember here that there are, there, there's kind of these, um, these levels, they're short, medium, and long. So uh, for whatever reason, this predator is only eating the medium length tailed birds. Yeah, so we wanna think about the fact that the birds with the short tails are gonna do really well, the birds with the long tails are going to do really well. So A is the best graph to represent that. The birds with the medium length tails are being eaten, they're being killed off. So we see the birds with the short tails This is a pretty common type of evolution. Um, it's, uh, there's actually a name for it. It's called divergent evolution. What will eventually happen, if we continue to see this over enough period, over a long period of time, is that those, those two birds will probably become two distinct species. They'll stop mating. They might occupy different territory. They might end up having different um, food preferences. But because we see them, we don't want to have birds that have medium length tails. They're just going to continue to separate. The birds with the short tails will get even shorter. The birds with the long tails will get even longer. Okay, I'm skipping this. Actually, all right, so I'll give you a little bit of background. Um, we've got just over 10 minutes left, uh, but there is an activity that, that kind of touches on this. So obviously the Industrial Revolution took place in the last 250 years, primarily in Western Europe and in the United States. Um, and it was this transition from an agrarian society, so a society that lived and worked on farms and, yes ma'am, yes. Uh, it was a transition from an agrarian society to an urban society where people were living in cities and you know, living in co close quarters to one another. They were employees of these massive corporations working in factories all day. Um, I could get into a lot of the social implications of that. But uh, the, the ecological implications were that high levels of soot and smoke were um, being produced and they were entering the, the surrounding environments. So you could literally see pictures of people who look like they're covered in like this, this black um, dirt. It's actually soot that is being produced by the factories. You could see it on the buildings, on the statues, and of course it even covered the, the surrounding natural landscape, the, the trees. Um, this had a big impact on the moth population, specifically in, in London at the time. Um, London has a high population of peppered moths. Before the Industrial Revolution, most of the trees were white. Um, and so most of the peppered moths, in order to be camouflaged within the tree, looked like that. They were, they were white. After the Industrial Revolution, as the trees got darker because of this um, soot that was being produced, the moths also got darker. Again, <clears throat> the variation that needed that was needed for this to happen already existed within the population. It's not like the dark moths just appeared out of nowhere. Some moths were already pretty dark, but over time we started to see more and more and more dark moths in order to provide some protection. So the color of the moths changed due to their environment. Interesting. Okay. Um, there is an activity, it's called the natural selection gizmo. Uh, I just wanna make sure you guys all have access to it before we go. I don't think there's gonna be enough time to actually do it today, but we can at least make sure that you all have joined the class. So the link is on Canvas. I'll show you.
<clears throat> so the website is called Explore Learning. Wait, what is it? Explore Learning. I just sent the link to the chat. <laughs> Once you're there, in the top right of your page, it'll say log in slash enroll. And the class enrollment code is on the screen right now. It's WXQWV6. I just sent that to the chat as well. I know several of you, I think, yeah, 11 of you have already joined because we've done these, we've done a gizmo before. Um, and if you if you have already joined, then you should be able to go in and see that the natural selection gizmo is available. Uh, if you have not yet joined the gizmo, then you need to go ahead and do so. Yes, Tay, are you raising your hand? Oh, okay.
All right, you guys, have a good day, and I will talk to you at 10 o'clock in the morning tomorrow. Short. Thank you. Mr. Ed? Yes. Um, does the website tell you my username? Because I don't remember it. Oh, yeah, I can tell you. Okay. Thank you. See you, Lance. Uh, that was Abigail, right? Talking just now? Yeah. Okay. Your username is your first name. I mean, it's Abigail7589. Okay, thank you. You can keep it. What'd you say? Abigail? I said thank you. Bye. Oh, you're welcome. Talk to you later.